evening <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining us today. Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals Limited would like to extend warm welcome to the experts and attendees for joining Endometriosis and Enigma Scientific Sangam Series Webinar 29, organized by Isopab Prayagraj in association with Allahabad Ox and Gynae Society. This webinar is uh, granted ISOG points. We would like to present our newly launched DRAG, our brand of Dinogest and Ethylene Estradiol for effective cy cyclic control and for suspected and confirmed cases of endometriosis, we have Endoreg brand of Dinogest. For today's scientific sorghum series, I welcome organizing chairperson, Dr. Ranjana Khanna, ma'am. Ma'am is founder, president, Isoba Prayagraj. She is also the ICOG governing council members, vice president, Foxy 2017. Now I request ma'am to please kindly initiate this session. Good evening, everyone. It's so heartening to see everyone in this extremely cold weather in Prayagraj. I mean, the temperatures here are four degrees. So uh, and <laughs> I welcome Dr. Parul Koddawala as the chief guest, Dr. Sampat Kumari as the guest of honor, and Dr. Manju Verma as our scientific expert. <laughs> First of all, we will begin by inviting our chief guest, Dr. Parul Koddawala. He is the newly elected, uh, the newly installed chairman of ICOG, of which I am a governing council member. So welcome Dr. Parul Koddawala. He is an endoscopic surgeon par excellence, consultant gynecologist, professor and head department of ONG Sai Institute of Medical Sciences, Ahmedabad. And he's got a Koddawala Women's Clinic as well. He's chairman ICOG, I have just said. He was vice, he's vice president of ISOPA. And uh, he has been president of Ahmedabad Society as well. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Parul, to uh, say a few words and bless our webinar. Well, thank you, Dr. Ranjana, for uh, nice words. It really feels a bit awkward to say that, uh, uh, say a few words on this or something like that. I'm not that senior. <laughs> okay. And I compliment you for activating the Allahabad Society so much and being so perseverant and persistent. Now, today's topic is such an issue. Uh, years back, I was uh, reading something like that, that whoever finds a cure for endometriosis will become next Bill Gates. Such is the potential of medicine for endometriosis. And we have been debating on this topic since last two decades on, in a big way. Surgery, medicine, combination, what comes first. Very recently, fertility, sterility had a special issue on this that surgery first or medicine first. So the last word is not out yet. And that is why we need to debate and discuss. Otherwise, there would be just a guideline. Okay. So I also see that you have a galaxy of prominent speakers and workers on endometriosis. I see at least three past chairpersons of endometriosis committee of Foxy. I see Ramani Devi here. I see Kuldeep here and the fresh, uh, I see also Asha Rao and the freshly installed committee chairperson Anu. So I'm sure that the deliberations today would be very fruitful. I also see some very senior colleagues from Foxy, Dr. Sampath Kumari is there. And I'm sure that deliberations today, I, I might be leaving out few of prominent people who are there as scientific experts also, but uh, let us not uh, eat away the time of webinar and let us move to the scientific stuff. I wish you well and I'll be there till the end, but I might miss out part of this. So please okay. excuse me for this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Parul. And now I would like to welcome my very dear friend, Dr. Sampat Kumari as the guest of honor. 
she has been the foxy yeah, vice president okay, just recently just recently she has been and uh, <laughs> founder secretary tn fox and uh, she is very dashing very dynamic and uh, you were chairperson na foxy adolescent health committee yes and of course icog governing council member so welcome dr sampath and uh, uh, now we have been for the scientific sangam uh, conference in allahabad we had a good time so first of all uh, thanks to dr parul he was also an adolescent committee chair before <laughs> earlier and now uh, for the he is a high cog chair chairperson and uh, i thank uh, the committee uh, organizing secretary amita and the conveners parul uma and uh, uh, abilasha and the scientific expert manju verma ranjana madam as parul sir has told once endometriosis ever endometriosis <laughs> that is the other problem going on but as far as possible we are going with the medical management and especially you are going to talk on recurrent adolescent mm -hmm. endometriosis whenever if you go for a surgical procedure in endometriosis whatever it is the first surgery should be a good surgery that is the only point now you have the uh, wonderful speakers like uh, dr ramani dr rohan and uh, yourself with the chairperson sasha rao lalita anu chawla vandana kuldeep and uh, shubha so i wish the success of this uh, webinar endometriosis any webinar any time if you have we can have some new uh, message from the speakers yes okay, i think uh, the delegates will have a good message from this webinar thank you so much for inviting me thank you and at the end of the day i feel that you can tame endometriosis you can't really cure it <laughs> you can suppress it so now i would like to uh, welcome the scientific expert dr manju verma she is a professor and hod and uh, uh, of mln medical college and past president up chapter of obs and gynae and uh, we welcome you ma'am and uh, i would like you to stay till the end and along with the experts to give your opinion so i would like to speak at the end okay <laughs> thank you so much ma'am and now i would hand over the session to dr parul khanna <clears throat> thank you ma'am so good evening uh, esteemed faculty and dear delegates we now start with our first session of the uh, 29th series of scientific sangam which is a talk by dr t ramani devi on managing hmb and dysmenorrhea what is the right choice i would now invite the chairpersons for the session our first our chairperson is dr asha rao ma'am is director rao hospital and care coimbatore director for post doctoral fellowship program in reproductive medicine and endogynecology She has been chairperson of endometriosis committee Foxy 2020 to 2023, past president of Coimbatore Obs and Gynae Society, organizing chairperson of numerous conferences Endo Site 2021, Uva yes, Foxy yes, South yes. Zone. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank Our you. Our next chairperson is Dr. Lalita Shukla, ma'am. She is senior consultant Obs and Gynaecology, Allahabad. Arogya Niketan Prayagraj. past president of alabad obs and gynae society ex chairperson of women's wing ama welcome ma'am i now request dr lalita shukla ma'am to introduce our speaker dr ramani t devi uh good evening everyone i hope i'm audible yeah, yeah. yes ma'am heavy menstrual bleeding <clears throat> and dysmenorrhea a combination of two distressing symptoms along with other problems which plague a patient of endometriosis it's truly devastating we are fortunate to have with us dr t ramani devi who is going to speak on the management of this condition she mm -hmm. is a past chairperson of endometriosis committee foxy 2014 2016 she has also been the national vice president foxy 2020 she has she's the on the international uh, advisory board member of fertility society of bangladesh okay, lalita i think you can stop just the past vice president and past chairperson of okay and you have many papers to your credit and you have many chapters in books so welcome ma'am we are looking forward to your talk first of all i thank uh, 
Dr. Ranjana Khanna Madam for asking me to do this topic today in, in her series of webinars. And I also thank, thank Jackson Paul for uh, having made me do this particular topic. And uh, let me thank all the other persons, other fellow faculties who have joined this. So the topic today given to me is how to manage heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea and what is the right choice. For this, I bring you greetings from the city of uh, Trichrapalli. You can see the beautiful Kaveri River as well as the rock fort. And you see the UNESCO accredited Sri Rangam temple. These two are the iconic places in Trichy, which one should definitely see. So now let me go to the uh, classification of abnormal but uterine bleeding. So in this, there are structural abnormalities and non-structural abnormalities. And the structural abnormality is goes by acronym POM, that is polyp, adenomyosis, leomyoma, malignancy, and hyperplasia. And then the non-structural anomalies are coagulopathies, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic causes, and not yet classified. Now we have under this endometrial, chronic endometritis is also included. And iatrogenic, uh, you have this, uh, 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 this mainly this uh, copper tea, foreign bodies, and LNG use, etc. And not yet classified, you have the newer inclusion of NISH inside uh, into this. So that is causing abnormal uterine bleeding. So this was a pictorial representation of the FIGO system 2 of uh, form coin classification where you can see the polyps here, adenomyosis where you can see this um, islets of this uh, endometrial cells within and leomyoma, malignancy and coagulopathies where the uh, vessels are at, uh, at problem. And then you can have the ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial crosses, then the iatrogenic, for example, misplaced IUCD, etc. So again, FIGO has again classified this ovulatory dysfunction in 2022 into uh, this uh, type 1 is hypothalamic, type 2 is pituitary, type 3 is ovarian, and then type 4 is, they have specially uh, grouped PCOS under class 4. So in type 1 hypothalamic, it can be genetic, autoimmune, or iatrogenic, or neoplastic. Type 2 is functional, infectious, inflammatory, trauma, and vascular. And ovarian is physiological, idiopathic, or endocrine. And type 4 includes PCOS. Now, how to evaluate HMB? Women with history of menstrual bleeding, uh, you have to assess the history, physical examination, including confirmation of the bleeding site, and then menstrual cycles, how they are, basic laboratory evaluation, complete blood count and the pregnancy test. Always in a reproductive age group, women, we have to do a pregnancy test when she comes with heavy menstrual bleeding. Then, we have already discussed this form coin classification. And the most important thing is you should have a basic imaging technology and the histopathology and rule out coagulopathy and endocrinopathy. So, based on this, disease-related medical treatment or disease-related surgical treatment should be planned. And it can be, again, to go in for an invasive or an expensive diagnostic tool such as sonohistography, hysteroscopy, and MRI will give us an idea what is the probable cause for heavy menstrual bleeding. Then, sometimes, what do you mean by heavy menstrual bleeding? The bleeding might last longer than seven days and the blood flow may be more than 80 ml during menstruation. The true prevalence is not clearly established in India. Almost one-third of the patients or more in the adolescent age group can have abnormal uterine heavy menstrual bleeding. And similarly, in the reproductive age group also, one-third of the women, they suffer from abnormal uterine bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding during their reproductive age, uh, age group. So one of the commonest gynec problems we see in our OPD and formerly it was known as menorrhagia. No, we have moved on to the terminology of heavy menstrual bleeding. So this abnormal uterine bleeding, we say it is it the interval should be less than 21 days or less. And then it, it can be abnormal uterine bleeding can be even beyond 35 days. And it should last for a period of seven days. And the mean blood loss should be 80 ml. So the term dysfunctional uterine bleeding is no longer used. 
So why we are so much bothered about abnormal uterine bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding? As I have mentioned earlier, one third of the women are affected at some point of time in the reproductive age group, leading to life-altering effects. AUB affects all members of the society, not only the menstruating individual. The physical, mental health effects of AUB includes, includes heavy menstrual bleeding, flooding accidents, discomfort, tiredness and depression. There are high global prevalence of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia associated with AMB and which are often unrecognized or underreported. AUB can cause strains on relationship and have a negative impact on the individual social network. Again, it can have negative impact on the job or the work and can have financial implication. There is again a high cost to the individual related to the getting this menstrual product themselves, clothes or bedding that are damaged by flooding accidents, loss of earnings due to this missed work, missed opportunities at work or school and also the treatment cost in countries where healthcare is privately funded. For society, economic implications relate to the impact of AUB on a substantial proportion of workforce as well as environmental impact of menstrual products. That is one important thing we have to look into it. That is the products which have been menstrual pads, all those things are causing a lot of uh, impact upon the environment, um, making, the, uh, pollu making it pollutant and uh, hence we have to look into it. Then how we are going to manage this heavy menstrual bleeding? The treatment can be medical or surgical. So the medical treatment, generally we start with the NSAID, mefenamic acid, tranexamic acid, epsilon amino, caproic acid, ethamsalate, or sometimes it can be only estrogen to begin with. Combined pills, progesterone-only agents like progesterone-only pills, DMPA injection, EN, uh, LNG, IUS, ethnogesterol implant, and at last we have the GNRH analogs. Both can be, both it can be an uh, agonist or an antagonist. So the preventive therapies for suppressing, for suppression of menorrhagia is estrogen progesterone combination. Uh, uh, that uh, previously we used to have intravenous estrogen, which is a good agent for reducing the bleeding, acute episode of bleeding, but we know the hazards that it can increase the thromboembolism. Now, most of us have switched on to the basic of NSAID or uh, ethamsalate or the um, uh, ethamsalate. And then uh, the next one is, this is commonly given for anybody. Then comes the progesterone-only agents, that is not ethysterone, which can be started with 5 milligram TDS. And then we can have, this should be called it once when the bleeding has settled and once when we have found out what is the cause Probably if there is no cause, the medroxyprogesterone can also be given intramuscular injection. Then levonorgestrel intrauterine device that can also reduce the bleeding. And uh, again, ethnogestrel implant. And then this is what we have I have mentioned, that is lupra depot or either an agonist or antagonist can be used. So then, so regarding this, you have to have a combination of, apart, apart from this, uh, uh, treatment of menorrhagia apart from the drugs, drugs mentioned here, we also have a good set of combined oral contraceptive pills about which we need to discuss. So then comes the surgical treatment that is dilatation and first thing is you try to do a ultrasound or, the, or a hysteroscopy and find out what is the basic cause. Then there are all um, um, uh, surgical management can be a simple dilatation and curettage or it could be a uterine artery embolization as in the case of uh, fibroids or focused ultrasound, um, uh, this is an MRG FUS, and then myomectomies, which can be conservative, then endometrial ablation or resection, and ultimately hysterectomy may be the end when the woman has reached the terminal end of the uh, perimenopause. Then how we are going to handle? If menorrhagia is present, first you ask the patient if rule out the uh, causes, structural causes, if structural causes are there, you try to focus at the structural causes and treat it. And then if there are no structural causes and if contraception is desired, maybe we can, yes, if contraception is not desired, NSA during menstruation can be given. And if it is effective, continue the same. And if it is not effective, maybe progesterone, we can give it. Either we can start continue for 21 days starting from day 5 or during the second half of the cycle. 
if it is effective then consider uh, consider it repeating in the next cycle maybe if it is not effective then we have to go for a hysteroscopy and proceed what is the cause suppose if contraception is desired the ideal form is a combined oral contraceptive pill and if the patient is very much comfortable with that continue that then if the patient is not having a relief with that maybe we can try with the lng iud and if the lng iud is effective then continue the same and then if it is not effective then maybe we have to think about terms of conservative endometrial ablation surgery or some um, conservative surgical methods instead of hysterectomy can be tried so now so far i have mentioned about the heavy menstrual bleeding then coming to the next slot that is the endometriosis by definition everybody knows it is the presence of normal endometrial tissue that is abnormally located in places other than the uterine cavity and what happens is this implants will grow, grow invade the vicinity cause inflammatory reaction now we are very clearly we understand that endometriosis is an inflammatory condition that is persistent for the lifelong and you need to treat the patient lifelong and uh, according to the need of the patient we have to treat if the the two important harms of endometriosis are pain and uh, fertile infertility if the pain is more dominant you have to look into the uh, give the care towards the managing the pain and if the patient is very keen on fertility you have to direct your attention towards the fertility management so you need to treat the endometriosis symptomatically treat the symptom rather than cause so endometriosis is highly prevented pre prevalent in certain patients that is among when you look into the infertility po population 25 to 40 percent of the patients who are infertile they have endometriosis and it is not that every endometriotic patient is an infertile patient they have spontaneous conceptions and about 40 to 50 patients with the 50 percent of the patients with endometriosis are infertile again when women have complaints of chronic pelvic pain and it is not responding to our routine treatment maybe 75 percent of these women are likely to suffer from endometriosis again dysmenorrhea is one important symptom starting from early adolescent lifespan and about 40 to 60 percent of the patient with dysmenorrhea they are supposed to have endometriosis so this uh, you uh, you come to a diagnosis of endometriosis in the early stage mainly based upon the symptom because endometriosis we know stage one and stage two we may not have any ultrasound evidence but the patient's important symptoms are my usual way of telling it as seven days like dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, dysuria, dystasia, diffuse abdominal pain, difficulty in conception, and uh, ultimately it will lead to depression. But among that, dysmenorrhea and dysparonia are the most important symptom in diagnosis of endometriosis. When you think about the prevalence, about 196 million women suffer from endometriosis globally, and among this, 50 million women belong to India alone. So then, coming to the most important aspect is, the diagnosis of endometriosis is not picked, uh, no, uh, not been done much earlier. They might take years together before the diagnosis of endometriosis is made. So it is not that on a single day the patient will develop day th uh, stage three or stage four of endometriosis, but slowly it starts with the stage one and two, and maybe it will take six years, seven years, and the patient would have moved from one patient to one consultant to the other. Finally, ultimately. Uh, a doctor, physician who is um, very uh, keen on getting the diagnosis can only pick it up. So then, dysmenorrhea, what is dysmenorrhea? It is a severe frequent menstrual clamp and pain that occurs during the period. Why do some women experience menstruation period cramps and pain? But not that every woman has got this, but it all depends upon the basic reason. For example, the a patient who is stressful with a poor physical health, Lack of physical activity, dehydration, endometriosis, polyps, and even submucous myomas, they can have high, heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea. Then again, organic causes are adenomyosis, uterine fibroids, insertion of copper IUCD for birth control, pelvic inflammatory disease, uterine defects, and anomalies can also cause dysmenorrhea. So, the, uh, we, uh, uh, when we classify dysmenorrhea, it is basically a primary dysmenorrhea or a secondary dysmenorrhea. Primary dysmenorrhea is the one that occurs, uh, pain occurs only during the day one of the period 
and lasts for one or two days. And usually it will be located in the lower abdomen, radiating to the lower back and legs. And it often improves, the primary dysmenorrhea often improves with aging. But whereas in secondary amenorrhea, we can say it is one to two, it starts before periods, it occurs during periods, and then even in patients with endometriosis, it continues even after the menstruation has stopped. And we typically call it as a triple dysmenorrhea. And again, it, uh, uh, as aging occurs, the secondary amenorrhea gets worsened. So, how we are going to manage the dysmenorrhea? Dysmenorrhea management is it may be it can be associated with heavy menstrual bleeding also. Try with NSAIDs. And if the patient girl or a patient starts missing her work or school, then maybe uh, we have to consider and then the healthcare provider should refer the patient to OBGYN. And again, if the patient, if the pain, uh, if it again depends whether the patient uh, needs pregnancy or not. So, among the pregnancy patients, it is totally a different one. And if they are not desirous of pregnancy, maybe we can start the treatment patients with the oral contraceptive pill, progestins or progestin containing IUCD, and the pain might become manageable. And then uh, we have to think about patients not responding to routine. NSAID and a trial of oral contraceptive pill, we have to think about uh, the diagnosis of endometriosis. So uh, the main advantage of putting uh, oral contraceptive pill in a dysmenorrheic patient is it will suppress ovulation and then the pain will get reduced. But it will only mask the symptoms of endometriosis or deep infiltrative lesions. But once when you stop the drug, it will come back like a boomerang. So then again, with all these things, medical management, if the pain is not settling down, then laparoscopy is the only thing. Now, according to all the learned societies, for example, ESHRAE guidelines, ASRM, even our FOXI, own FOXI guidelines, they all say that if the diagnosis of endometriosis should be based upon the symptoms and there is no need to have a laparoscopy or there is no need to have a histopathological confirmation before you start the treatment. So if the pain persists, then maybe you can, laparoscopy can be done. And then once when lap, the laparoscopy should be done only once in the lifetime of the patient and it should be done perfectly. So if it is not responding to progesterone, maybe we can try with GnRH analogs. And then uh, the patient, if the patient in between wants to conceive, maybe you turn your attention towards the fertility management and should be referred to a proper fertility con consultant and uh, they should be uh, uh, subjected based upon the um, uh, staging of the endometriosis and the other factors. They can be planned for ovulation induction with IUI or even they can straight away be taken to ART. So ultimately, once when the conception is over and when the family is con completed, the patient can again be put on OCP or progestin. And if the pain continues and depressing, it is not uncommon to see even a young patient 35 plus years to come and beg for us to have a hysterectomy done for her because of the severe pain and depression. Maybe the end will be the uh, hysterectomy for her. So now let us see what are all the common drug therapies. They are COCs, NSAIDs, GnRH agonists, progestins. And among the uh, other newer drug therapies, aromatase inhibitors can be used as a second line. Anti-angiogenic drugs like the VEGF inhibitors like uh, gabargolin. And then estrogen receptor uh, ligands, statins, serms, sperms, and then pro uh, GnRH antagonists are now coming up in a big way. We have the elagolix, we have uh, relagolix, and the linsagolix, which are trying to enter the Indian marketing. So these are the common NSAID we will know. Uh, we know, and ethamcelate is also one drug which can correct both uh, abnormal, I mean, heavy menstrual bleeding as well as heavy menstrual bleeding. Then again, combined oral contraceptive pill, we have the combination of this ethanol, estradiol, and uh, uh, progestin can be anything. So we have a lot of this progestin starting from, uh, uh, let me move on this, and these are all the GnRH and, and agonists, and you have the antagonists, what I have mentioned earlier. So the treatment of choice in the Indian scenario is, if you want to treat heavy menstrual bleeding, number one, number two, dysmenorrhea, and both contraception, and uh, uh, the ideal drug first choice will be the combined oral contraceptive pill and uh, the hormonal therapy can be used very safely. 
So we have the combination of dynages with ethanyl estradiol. Combination ethanyl estradiol. This dynages is a fourth generation progestin, and uh, the uh, main advantage of this the fourth generation progestin is that it doesn't have androgenicity. It can inhibit ovulation. Follicular development, growth of endometrial cells, as well as cytokine production. So, by the virtue of the cytokine production diminishing the trait, this can in, uh, red, uh, improve the uh, pain factor part of it. So, then we have uh, fourth generation progestin dinages and rosperinone. They block the angiogenesis, inhibits the neovascularization, and no adverse uh, reactions like. Uh, Reduction in BMD, no anti-androgenic activity and no androgenic effects such as acne, hirsutism, obesity, in, uh, in increased libido or virilism, no steroid hormone action other than the progestin. So that is the main advantage of this fourth generation progestins over that of first and second generation one. So it is the, this Dynagest is a hybrid progestin which we are all familiar with and I can skip off this pharmacokinetics. And mode of action is both central and local action and uh, highly selective binding to that of the progesterone receptors and it is secre it will inhibit both the central level as well as the peripheral level leading to hypoestrogenic status. So there, there will be decidualization and atrophy of the ectopic endometrium. So this atrophy of ectopic endometrium causes a reduction in the pain factor as well as the utopic endometrium. It will reduce the bleeding anti-angiogenic, anti-inflammatory and pro anti-proliferative action. So this is a very important slide where you can compare Dynages with the other progestin and di Dynages has got a progestogenic activity, anti-androgenic activity and again glucocorticoid activity is absent. So this is the main advantage of it. So when you take it, so again the say it has got no abnormal, uh, no effects upon the thyroid. Um, carbohydrate metabolism, lipid metabolism. It has a balanced effect upon the hemostasis and uh, um, insulin-like growth factor. And then adrenal hormones and PP, PP parameters are all maintained. And hemostatic effect is there. So we have this combination of dinages 2 milligram with ethanyl estradiol, 30 microgram. And um, they, it acts like dinages act by prevention of ovulation inhibits follicular development, thickens the cervical mucus, makes the uh, sperm to enter the uterus and then prevents the sperms to enter the uterus by thickening of the mucus and it has got a positive effect on the skin, skin mainly upon the acne. And then ethanyl estradiol will stabilize the endometrium, preventing the irregular shedding and then preventing unwanted breakthrough bleeding and making endometrium difficult for fertilized egg to implant, regulate menstrual cycle and prevent irregular bleeding. So the dosage is 21 bar 7. And this can be very safely used in treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding, dysmenorrhea as a contraceptive, good cycle control, acne and hair grease. It is being diminished. See, when the patient continues to take uh, uh, this uh, combination of ethanyl estradiol with the dinages, we have to wait at least for a period of 12 months to get the improved uh, improvement in acne. And then it reduces uh, the hair grease is also altered it normalizes the hair growth so it starts from day three for 21 days and seven day pill free interval should be there so once when you discontinue the uh, drug well, how long it takes it, it takes for the fertility to return so this is uh, in a study by 706 patients they found out that 94 percentage of the patient the complete um, analysis they could cut, get it and the mean time for pregnancy was only 3.5 cycle. And then, so to conclude, this present pr prospective study revealed only a slight delay in regaining the fertility. So the cumulative pregnancy rate is good. And when you continue, when you look into the acne part of it, I said for acne, the most, uh, 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 the ideal drug is better than Diane 35, where there is a combination of ciprotin and acetate with ethanol estradiol. DNG with ethanyl estradiol is supposed to have a better effect in correcting the acne. And this was another acne study from Poland where they have also found out that there is a marked reduction in the uh, acne and it takes 12 months for the acne to settle down. So this can be an ideal drug in management of acne. And regarding the safety and tolerability of the drug, there are no, no not much of adverse effects and minimal side effects like this breast pain, minimal weight gain can happen 
and the headache, nausea, vomiting, like any other oral contraceptive pill, and sometimes migraine can happen. Otherwise, major adverse effects outcomes are not uh, seen in this drug. So there is a good tolerability over 15 years of use. And again, the response to the thrombophlebitis, the rate is just the rate of 0.45 events per 1,000 women years. So they have uh, they have done a second a Polish study where they found out there was no thrombophlebitis occurring in contrast, the incidence of rates of venous thromboembolism for desogestrol plus levonorgestrel con uh, containing OCP is at uh, 0 0.535, whereas for this particular molecule, it is only 0 0.27 per 100 women. Yeah, so it has got an excellent tolerability. And to summarize, it, uh, the, it has got a high contraceptive effect and it can reduce the um, cycle control is good. It can improve dysmenorrhea, anti-androgenic effect, so reduces the hirsutism and other acne, etc. And then again, uh, this is anti-acne effect and safety is very good. And uh, uh, ultimately, I, uh, <clears throat> this particular drug is very effective in management of both heavy menstrual bleeding as well as uh, dysmenorrhea. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a very complete talk. Uh, I now request Dr. Asha Rao, ma'am, to give her expert comments. Thank you, Dr. Ramani. It was an excellent talk. At the outset, let me congratulate Dr. Ranjana Khanna for having organized such a fantastic scientific program. And Ramani has uh, given an excellent talk, telling us each and every point about managing dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia. So, uh, Dr. Ramani, just one simple doubt. What would you say is the best medication for managing uh, menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea in a young girl of 19 to 20. Dysmenorrhea, primary dysmenorrhea, maybe with NSAD she can improve. But we do not know what is the underlying cause for her dysmenorrhea. So that is one important thing. So maybe in such situations we can use this oral contraceptive pills which will give her great relief from dysmenorrhea. And if we feel that uh, looking at the background of family history, because we know that endometriosis occurs in a family, maybe uh, in such situation, ideal will be a combination of uh, dynages with ethanol estradiol. Because it has got a good potency as well as the side effects are low when compared to the other uh, combined oral contraceptive pills that are available. Yeah, will you be worried about the estrogen component promoting the uh, continuation of DIE in this Young girls, very see, old. That, uh, that, is all, that is all. That is all. You cannot rule out. <laughs> see, in early adolescent girls with dysmenorrhea, even by ultrasound evidence, we cannot find up deep infiltrated. That's exactly what I'm asking. You cannot yeah, rule we out. We cannot find out. We cannot rule out. A combination of estrogen and uh, dynogist for yeah. a long term. But estrogen is basically, uh, I mean, endometriosis is a hyper estrogenic condition. Yes. So mm -hmm. if we are pumping in more estrogen, it's likely to flare up. Yeah, that is what, madam, what uh, Professor Thomas Romer says and Chapron says. They all say that giving oral contraceptive pills to these young girls with suspected endometriosis, what yeah. it actually does, it does it, the retrograde menstruate, menstruation, <laughs> the endometriotic cells, they get aggravated. The, uh, there will be uh, more of endometriosis when you give... Uh, um, oral contraceptive pills though so they are only for giving only progestins but uh, this combination can will be an ideal one for heavy menstrual bleeding because we know this progestins are going to cause desdualization and atrophy of the utopic endometrium also so for a combination of heavy menstrual bleeding with dysmenorrhea maybe a primary one this can help how long can you give it in a young girl I mean, what's the maximum period of time in which you can use it? See, it's a million dollar question. But again, it is like a common contra oral contraceptive pill and which has got a low incidence of thrombosis. And especially when the girl is sexually active, I think it is better they continue even for two or three years. It is found to be safe because they, the data are saying that thrombophlebitis incidence is much lower than in this combination compared to the other OC pills. Yeah, because it's rather low dose. Yes. 
rather low dose yeah. but uh, what should about we allow them withdrawal bleed or uh, should we should give them continuously or we should allow them to have withdrawal bleeds in between see for endometriosis you are asking my yes. personal choice for endometriosis is only a progesterone i don't yeah. prefer an ethanol estradiol plus progesterone combination right when right we are in doubt maybe we can give a continuous three month cycle of uh, this combination drugs ask her to see when she bleeds it will be only minimal so then yeah. start her on a combination again so make her bleed only three or four times a year that is going to suppress we can and also keep her only in diagnosis and yes, the role right. of lupralide injection like if you want to give lupralide acetate so lupralide injection is uh, first of all we must understand that it can be given for any woman who is only beyond 16 years Okay. Yes. And we should be after puberty. Uh, after, I mean, sixteen or some of the textbooks are written even after eighteen. So that is not. And again, we know the uh, uh, like uh, the adverse side effects of uh, uh, lupralide, which has got in the form of reduced BMI and hot flashes, and mm -hmm. so many things are there. And the more than that, the initial flare effect of lupralide is going to cause them. So when you are putting the patient for the first time on. GnRH agonists, we have to tell them that initially there may be flaring of the symptoms. Maybe for severe deep infiltrative endometriosis or uh, uh, ovarian endometrioma, initially maybe we can give her, give the patient two or three shots of uh, lupride followed by only dinages. That will again reduce the endometrial uh, th the thickness and it will prevent the spotting when you continue the patient on dinages. But so one one Ramani, I think you can always give norepinephrine. Add back. Or oh, yes, yes. To give add back therapy. Add back, add back therapy is a add must. Back. Yeah, yeah. So that, that is add back therapy is only okay. when you are going to use uh, hmm. lupralide lepo beyond three to six months. See, see. The initial thing may not need the add back therapy. But we have to clearly understand that all patients with endometriosis, they do not respond to progestin. Only six. 33% of them, they will not respond to progestin. And these are the candidates whom you have to choose the other drug like the GnRH. This is the reason is the progesterone resistance is too much. So that is the reason why. And again, there will be a suppression of the 17 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, whereby the conversion to estradiol and estrone is blocked. So there will be piling up of the estradiol. And these are the group of people who will not respond to dinage. That is why even if you put dinages for some, some patients, they respond very well. And endometrioma will regress in some patients. But in many, <clears> so a few of the patients, one part of the patient, there will not be any regression. So they, those are the candidates who need a newer molecules like a GnRH antagonist. And uh, Ramani, to reduce okay. the flare, you can always give a course of registron. And under cover of that, you can give the GnRH, which is good yes. for the GnRH also. Yes, madam. That we can give it. Yeah. You have had wonderful discussion, Ramani. You have so beautifully described each and every point. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, madam. You, Manju Varma, ma'am, would you like to say something? Manju, madam, your expert comment. Yeah. Well, I think uh, almost all the points have been covered very nicely by everyone. You know, the discussion has been very, very enlightening. And uh, the only thing is that whatever we say, we should start with the minimum uh, drug. That's you should start with the painkillers first. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then you go on to the hormonal and hormonal, the first is OCs and then you can proceed on to GnRH and further to erotase inhibitors. So this is how it has to be a gradual process uh, to be mm -hmm. done. And especially one has to be careful as far as the young girls are concerned that yeah. please don't start the, the, um, the GnRH before the lady is, uh, the girl is 16. I have taken an average mm -hmm. 16 or 18. So let's take it 17. 17. Yeah, some, some of the guidelines <laughs> 17. So it should always be given only. And I don't think they usually need it. They they respond very well. And nowadays we have got dinosaurs as one of the drugs which can be given to these girls uh, even now uh, at the age of 16, you know. Yeah. So that's uh, that's why um, yeah. better to give it the safer drug first. And add back, of course. With the if you are giving to it for but a long time, but with just you have to tell them that sometimes the cycles become irregular. Initially, they have yes. only spotting. <laughs> Cycle doesn't become irregular. Yeah, spotting, spotting. spotting. That we have no, to tell them. 
they so have to be counseling has not be controlled with the dynogest you may have to give initial <laughs> progesterone control the bleeding and then yeah 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 dynogest. exactly so, that is best to give first uh, menorrhagia can uh, also become worse with dynogest in some people yeah so thank you ma'am thank you thank you we now move on to our second session i now hand over the session to dr uma jaiswal ma'am thank you dr parul after a detailed and very informative talk by dr t ramni devi ma'am a very important topic of daily yoga practice and we come across many problems at this detailed discussion thank you now we move ahead on our second session on endometriosis and infertility for this we have chairperson dr anu chawla she is chairperson endometriosis committee foxy 2427 just newly elect she is mrcog md dnb fmas frf ficog director london fertility clinic our second chairperson is dr vanna vansal ma'am she is infertility and ivf specialist and laparoscopic surgeon of our own city pragrash now i request dr vanna vansal ma'am to introduce our speaker dr rohan pashwikar he speaks on endometriosis and infertility so hello ranjana and hello everyone so i have this proud privilege today <laughs> to introduce before you dr rohan palshetkar a uh, very renowned young dynamic gynecologist and ivf specialist he is the chairperson of foxy young talent promotion committee he is a managing committee member of uh, AR, M mccs sr and mtr he is the professor in dy patil uh, school of medicine head of the reproductive medicine fellowship program dy patil school of medicine Hello, the multiple publication in national and international journals and he has received various awards so many awards i can see and he is a very uh, and uh, son of my very very dear friend dr nandita palshetkar so uh, he is going to speak on the a very very important topic endometriosis and infertility dr rohan thank you so much madam thank you for such a kind introduction and i must say that it's always a pleasure to be a part of the prayagraj obgy society because it always treats me like a second home like a son <laughs> from prayagraj itself I must say, Ranjana ma'am, thank you for inviting me. You put me in between two doyens. To give <laughs> talk. It's quite, it's quite a task to do so. Uh, at the outset, I want to just thank you, ma'am, for inviting me, and I want to thank uh, the organizing uh, secretary and the scientific uh, expert, uh, Manju Arma, ma'am, uh, Amita Tripathi, ma'am, and I want to thank the conveners as well, Parul. uh uma jaiswal ma'am and abhilasha kumar ma'am i'll be talking about endometriosis and infertility today and firstly i want to say that following <coughs> rani devi ma'am is going to be quite the challenge she is the queen of uh, endometriosis plus we had asha da asha rao ma'am as well who was giving her expert comments and i honestly i hope i am able to do justice and i am able to give you good take home messages uh, on the treatment of infertility and endometriosis Now, if you look at endometriosis and what is its effect on fertility, there are three main points which we are looking at. One is that there's going to be a loss of follicular pool, there's going to be a declining quality of oocytes, and there's going to be re reduced endometrial receptivity. Now, if you look at the study which was published all the way back in October two thousand and eighteen by uh, Muzi, what it says is. Yes, the presentation is there, which talks about it. But I want want to understand, make you understand that patients with endometriosis have a decreased AMH level as compared to the age matched controls. And our major concern is that that patients with endometriosis are going to have a reducing uh, AMH level. So even if you look at a twenty eight year old, you look at a thirty two year old, or you look at a thirty five year old, the AMH with the age controlled matches is always going to be lower in patients of endometriosis. in addition to that we are also going to be having a declining quality of oocyte now why is that 
one, there's going to be increased apoptosis. There's a dysregulation of the molecular pathway. Again, the steroid, uh, there is the granulosa cell steroidogenesis by decreasing the expression of the P450 aromatase. There's a presence of an increased oxidative stress status in the follicular fluids as well. And it's been recently confirmed in follicles surrounding the endometrioma. So there's a lot of studies which are talking about the AMH as well as the oocyte quality. So we need to understand that this disease, as uh, Ramni Devi ma'am was talking, that it needs to be caught early. It needs to be treated early in order to make sure that the fertility is maintained for these women in the uh, women in the long run. The next thing, what madam, uh, what we are going to talk about is the reduced endometrial receptivity. See, when we look at endometriosis and we're looking at the treatment, we're always thinking that it's going to affect the oocyte quality. It's just going to affect the ovaries. We have to make sure that the ovaries are controlled. But we have to understand that endometrial receptivity is also going to be affected. There could be abnormalities of the utopic endometrium in women with endometriosis, which could be uh, contributing to implantation failure. Ramni Devi, madam, was just talking about in the discussion that almost 33%, that's one out of three patients, are going to have progesterone, uh, progesterone uh, receptor resistance. And this is going to reduce the endometrial receptivity and cause the luteal phase dysfunction. See, understand that whenever we add progesterone, we're always looking at that change from that triple layer to a slightly more diffuse endometrium when we're looking at receptivity. So if there's endometrial... Uh, uh, sorry, if there is progesterone resistance, the effect of the progesterone is not going to take place. And in addition to that, when we are looking at the luteal phase support, if especially if you're doing a frozen uh, hormonal cycle, then at that point, the luteal phase is not going to be adequate to support the pregnancy. Therefore, we're not going to get a pregnancy rate. In addition to that, there's going to be autoantibodies to the antigen in the endometrium, which further reduces the endometrial receptivity as well as the implantation as well. Now, how do you manage? Now, that is a magical question, which is the most difficult to answer. If you, Ramni Devi ma'am was talking about which drug to use and what to use when. So that is going to be always a challenge. And that's why this disease always remains an enigma to us. And there's always research being done in order to decide what is the treatment protocol to go ahead. Protection of the fertility is going to be our primary treatment. And we have to catch this early. We're talking about endometriosis and fertility. Remember this, if caught early, is when you're going to be protecting the fertility from the start. So our target uh, patients need to be the adolescent and young unmarried who are talking about dysmenorrhea and pain. I'm sure Ranjana ma'am is going to be covering this in her next talk anyway. So I don't want to get into too much detail. But we should not be... No, no, you cover it. You are the fertility specialist. <laughs> Yes, but I'll also be dealing with it. Yes, ma'am. So <clears throat> that when we're talking about dysmenorrhea, we should not be taking it lightly. We should not be telling young girls that, listen, it's a part and parcel of the process. It will take over. Fine, they're getting a little bit of dysmenorrhea. Please make sure that you investigate these girls thoroughly. Ensure that they don't have endometriosis and the early diagnosis is going to be the ideal way to go. Now, I'm not going to get into the suppressive therapy because my, uh, Ramni Devi ma'am has already talked about it in totality. In fact, I think she's covered it beautifully. Just one other thing that I like to add is that we need to follow up with these girls. Don't tell them that, yeah, take these pills. We'll see you after six months to a year. I truly believe that every three months we should be uh, following them up. In fact, Dinogest, which we were talking about for how long to give, there have been studies talking about giving it for two years, five years. But also we need to understand that in these young girls, the mental health also has to be taken into account because Dinogest, which is unfortunately not spoken about, can cause depression in these young girls and that needs to be taken into account as well. Uh, obviously, besides the suppressive therapy, the surgery that always can be considered. And I know this has been said more than enough, but the primary surgery is going to be the best surgery. So if you are not an expert at endometriosis surgery, either refer the patient to a person who's a, a, a expert or call the expert to your OT in order to ensure that you're able to do the best possible surgery while ensuring that the ovarian reserve is maintained as well. And number four, obviously, is fertility preservation, which I will be talking, out, talking about throughout my presentation. 
Now, there is also this oral antagonist, which is available right now. Uh, basically, it needs to be done with or without add back therapy. Remember, your ocipils and progesterones are going to be your first choice. But if there is progesterone resistance, we were talking about GNRH agonist, but GNRH oral antagonist can also be done. Uh, yes, they are not currently available in India, but they are planning to be launched in India within the next three to six months. So it is going to be effective in uh, the treatment and it will become a, part, a regular part of the treatment therapy as well. Now, uh, sorry. Yeah. So now surgery in a cyst size of more than three centimeters. Remember that when you have a, surge, a cyst that is more than three centimeters, there is a risk of iatrogenic in, uh, injury to the adnexa. So we have to ensure that whenever we're operating, we have to be as conservative in the surgery as possible. I already mentioned that it should be performed by the expert surgeon. Benefits of the surgery should always be weighted against the potential damage to the ovarian reserve. And after surgery, we have to give continuous suppressive uh, treatment to ensure that there's no recurrence because we can't keep operating on these patients again and again. Bilateral or big endometriomas, ethanol washing, that's still going to be always a questionable doubt. Oocyte cryopreservation is something that we should maybe consider prior to surgery. And even ovarian tissue freezing can be offered to individuals with such big endometriomas. Because at times, sometimes the surgery can be so extensive that it's not possible to be more conservative in your treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, why did I talk about oocyte vitrification? This paper published in uh, Fertility Sterility in 2021 by Anna Kobo. <laughs> Anna Kobo, in fact, has been talking about fertility preservation for years at end. She's come up with some beautiful papers. In fact, she has said that oocyte vitrification in younger girls should be done because when you do freezing in oocytes in women less than 35, if you, even if you're getting about 10 eggs, you get a clinical uh, live birth rate of 40 to 70%. I'm, I'm talking about cumulative live birth rate. I'm not talking about the clinical pregnancy rate. Imagine if a woman, a younger woman, See, 35 is for the Western population. I always believe that the Indian population, the AMH drops down much faster. So when I'm talking about younger women who are diagnosed with endometriosis, whether they're married, unmarried, at least counsel them regarding fertility preservation. I'm not saying that force them to go through it, but at least they should be aware that there is fertility preservation available for them. In fact, in today's scenario, there's so many patients who I keep talking to and keep telling them that, you should consider fertility preservation. They said, Doc, I wish we knew about this earlier. In fact, I'm just going to give a small anecdote from my own life. My wife and I did embryo cryopreservation when we got married because we didn't want to have kids for a few years. We did get pregnant naturally, but we always knew that we had the embryos as a backup. So in fact, now my mother and my wife are keeping on telling me that, Rohan, we can still use those embryos. Let's have a second one. Anyways, getting back to the surgical treatment of endometriosis, when we're looking at it, this was a paper which was in fact, I think, published by Donez uh, et al. as well as this was in Human Reprod, which was published by Becker. We should handle the ovarian tissue as atraumatically as possible. Be aware of the risk of damage to the ovarian reserve during surgery. Fertility preservation should be considered, especially when the AMH is already low in patients and they are planned for surgery. Oocyte or embryo cryopreservation prior to surgery should be offered or you can even offer ovarian tissue cryopreservation at the time of surgery. In fact, there was a very good paper which was recently published in 2021 by Dormans uh, where they did a five paper, uh, where they did a five center study on ovarian uh, tissue cryopreservation where they've even talked about conceiving naturally post ovarian tissue cryopreservation. So that's something that is made a lot of advancements and it can be offered now. What Donna said that use the combined ablation and cystectomy technique. This was published all the way in 2009. In fact, he's published a paper right now also talking about this. He's basically talked about doing a cystectomy where he, you remove about 90% of the cyst till you reach the hilum. And then you just use the laser to ablate the remaining uh, cyst wall. This reduces the risk associated with cystectomy and recurrence with ablation alone. 
basically what he is trying to do is he's trying to avoid bleeding so that if there's less bleeding what ends up happening is you don't use too much energy sources near the hilum where the ovarian tissue is present another thing is that a lot of the endoscopic surgeons do end up using is doing a cystectomy with vasopressin i think one vasopressin as i've written reduces the requirement for bipolar coagulation needed for hemostasis it also reduces the amount of healthy tissue removal since the injection basically improves the plane of surgery Be see we all have done vaginal hysterectomies at some point we are always doing the hydro dissection to create the plane this similarly creates a plane between the normal tissue and the cyst and it's easier to strip out and it also reduces bleeding so using vasopressin as during the time of surgery can also help in fact a lot of surgeons inject it even into the uterine cavity so as to prevent bleeding from not uterine cavity into the uterus to uh, prevent bleeding from occurring Avoidance of repeated surgery, uh, it has been reported that about 13% of cases can go into ovarian failure and the decision to proceed with surgery should be carefully considered if a woman has had a previous ovarian surgery. This is when we need to develop the synergy between the infertility specialist and the endoscopic surgeons. I know that they are always fighting about endometriosis, but I think there's a point where we have to become symbiotic rather than antagonistic. So I think the approach always needs to be teamwork and a multidisciplinary one, especially when it comes to it. Now, in, recur in recurrent cases, especially, we can think about ethanol sclerotherapy for endometriosis. So these are the 10 basic steps. Earlier, firstly, you need to do an MRI maybe to rule out malignancy. A cyst size of 2.5 to 10 centimeters especially could be considered. You take a 17-gauge needle, do a transvaginal scan with the needle guide, Aspirate the cyst completely. Remember, you can't use the vacuum which we use for oocyte for um, for oocyte retrieval. You need a proper syringe which is uh, going to suck it out. The cyst fluid should be sent for cytologic assessment every time. Then you flush the cyst with saline two three times until the fluid is completely clear. Then you inject uh, ethanol solution at about sixty percent volume. Leave the ethanol for ten minutes. Aspirate the ethanol. Patient should not move during the ethanol step. Basically, make sure that the anesthesia is deep. This is basically what Susan said because they use a lot of local uh, anesthesia. At the end of the cyst, the cyst should be around less than 2 millimeters. And to provide prevent vaginal in, to prevent infection, you can do vaginal swabs one week prior and definitely give antibiotics and keep the patient in admitted for 48 hours. Now, where the sclerotherapy actually takes its place is patients with poor uh, who are poor surgical candidates where you know that they've had previous surgery or you know that there's a frozen pelvis, patients with diminished ovarian reserve or previous surgery with diminished ovarian reserve. Now, when we look at patients with mild to minimal endometriosis, if you're doing a hysterolaparoscopy, don't think of it just a diagnostic one, especially when you go in and you see endometriotic spots or small areas. Please make sure that you remove them or coagulate them. Operative should always be there. So I think we need to change our concept of writing in our consent form that diagnostic hysterolaparoscopy or SOS operative. We should, I think, make it like a fertility uh, enhancing hysterolaparoscopy so that to ensure that if there is anything surgical, we are covered by law, especially in the consent. In patients of endometriosis, you should consider uh, con uh, sorry, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation with IUI. In fact, gonadotropin should be considered. I generally use a combination of sequential regimen where I use oral ovulogens along with gonadotropins to ensure that we get the best possible success rates and still manage to maintain the expenses for the Indian population. Now, certain patients can actually benefit to, from going directly to IVF rather than doing a surgery and then going for IVF. These patients are going to be patients who are of older age, diminished ovarian reserve, bilateral endometriosis, endometriomas or patients with prior surgical tre treatment. The presence of an endometrioma does not appear to adversely affect the IVF outcomes and surgical excision of endometriosis does not necessarily improve IVF outcomes. However, it basically depends on how much the extensive uh, endometrioma is. I think you should end up doing the, this is usually what I end up following, a sandwich therapy where we do the oocyte pickup 
then maybe if the patient does require surgery, plan the surgery, give about two to three months of GNRH agonist and then go in for the transfer. This is generally what we end up doing for the treatment. And if the patient just has a small endometrioma, say about three or four centimeters, at that point, I do the pickup, suppress them for about two to three months with the agonist and then go with the embryo transfer. Recurrent endometrioma, the pregnancy rate is half of that of the primary surgery, plus there is chances of ovarian failure. So therefore, in recurrent endometriosis, I think it's a better option to go in directly for a IVF rather than for surgery prior to IVF. Now, how do you improve your treatment? GNRH agonist pretreatment with aromatase inhibitor could be another possibility. OC pretreatments, dopamine agonist pretreatments, and frozen go for frozen transfers rather than going for maybe a fresh transfer. Now, basically, this was a patient. Uh, this was a study which was published in 2018 where they actually thought of adding GNRH agonist during the luteal phase. Suppose. It's said to improve implantation rates, clinical pregnancy rates, as well as ongoing pregnancy rates. Personally, I've never added GNRH agonist to the luteal phase in either regular patients or endometriosis patients. And I've not seen any difference. This is my personal outlook, but the study seems to have quite a few patients and the study seems to be strong. Oral contraceptives, it's been seen that if you give oral contraceptives, especially for suppressing the cavity in patients, uh, it has shown better results. And in fact, now when we do have Dinogest containing OC pills, it may be of added benefit. Progesterone primed uh, ovarian stimulation. This is another thing that's being used now uh, recently. It has said that it has equivalent results, whether you use an agonist, antagonist, or a PPOS cycle. However, a major thing is that the pain post a PPOS cycle, especially if you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, the menstrual pain is highly reduced when you're using a PPOS cycle. This is when you look at a fresh or frozen embryo transfer. When we look at the fresh or frozen group, we can see that the clinical pregnancy rates are higher, 30% to 43% uh, in the frozen group. Uh, cumulative ongoing pregnancy rates are also higher. And even the cumulative live birth rate is higher if you go in for a frozen transfer for an endometriosis group. Just a word of advice, when you're doing the pickup, by chance, if you do rupture the end, uh, endometrioma, please make sure that you then evacuate the endometrioma. You can't use the OPU uh, uh, suction. You may have to switch to a syringe and suck it out. After that, make sure that whatever has been sucked out, they, the you change the needle. You use a fresh needle to pick up the rest of the oocytes. Inform the lab that you've uh, ruptured the endometrioma. Make sure that the... Uh, lab uh, the embryologist is using different dishes with uh, for the fluid which contains the endometrioma and the other oocytes and make sure that you admit the patient for at least two days with good antibiotic cover because that's going to ensure that the patient doesn't develop an infection or a pelvic abscess there have been multiple advances in the laboratory as well which has been there but i don't think it we have the bandwidth to cover it in this uh, uh, webinar because these are different things. And in endometriosis, they pretty much do add to improving the success rates as well. So to conclude my talk, I just want to say that we need to catch endometriosis early, diagnose it and suppress it early to ensure that it doesn't cause damage to the AMH, uh, sorry, the ovarian reserve as well as the oocyte quality. When you're doing surgery, especially a cystectomy, gently handle the ovaries, minimize cauterization, minimize tissue loss. Maybe what you do is use vasopressin and maybe use Donez's combined technique. Pre-ART suppressive therapy, I think it's still a little bit up in the air whether to do it or no. But what I would advise is post a surgery, definitely suppress the patients to avoid any recurrence. Fertility preservation should be offered to all patients undergoing endometriosis surgery. Make sure you counsel them properly. No need to tell them that they need to do it, but at least counsel them and give them the option. Leave that decision up to the patient. Frozen thought embryo transfers appear to improve pregnancy outcomes, especially when you are pre-treated with GNRH agonist. And if you use the progesterone primed ovarian stimulation, it may alleviate the pain symptoms of women with endometriosis undergoing ART. So thank you so much for a patient hearing. 
I hope I was able to do justice to this talk and I hope I gave good take-home messages for you all to implement in your practice. Thank you, Dr. Ruan, for a very enlightened talk and very informative. And request Dr. Okay. Anu to give your expert comment. Yes, hello, everybody. I'm so privileged to hear my co-chairperson and I'm, I felt the energy was different today. It was uh, at another level. Uh, very crisp. Uh, he's obviously very, very competent as a doctor I've seen uh, over the years. And I'm so proud of you, Rohan. And today I could feel a different level of energy. Now you're the chairperson of uh, YTP committee. So, and uh, the talk was so good. You rightly put the effort on the egg uh, cryopreservation, I would say. And uh, beautifully um, said in very small interval of time. And thank you everybody for having me here. Now, I request Dr. Manji, ma'am, please give your expert comment. Well, I am no, I'm not an infertility specialist, number one. So, Rowan, I would like to simply say that your talk was excellent. excellent. Hearing well, you was really a pleasure to the ear and the feast to the eyes. That's what I can say. Yeah. The thing is, in such a small uh, time, you have covered almost everything what uh, one should know. So, that's what I can say. Only the, the details... You can directly talk to Dr. Rohan. You, you took us in this you, you took us in the fascinating world of IVF. Can I say yeah. something, Dr. Yeah, Anjana? Yeah, yeah, of course yeah. you can. Pandaman, please. Yeah, thank you, Rohan. It was so clear. Very, very clear, very informative, and you were at a different level altogether. Uh, sometime, Dr. Rohan, in yes. bilateral endometriosis, especially, as you said, that we should go for the ovum pickup first. But you know, sometimes what happens when there is a big endometrioma and if they have bilateral, and if I you want to go for the pickup initially, sometime in one of my patients, the endometriosis is ruptured during yes. the course of a stimulation. So we have to be very, very careful, especially if we have bilateral in, in one of ovary, if it is big endometrioma. So while doing the stimulation, we have to be really very, very careful. Because Absolutely. we... And the, another thing, very nicely you have said that the ovarian tissue cryopreservation is very upcoming. And we should uh, more promote, especially if the uh, girl is, you know, operated at a young age, if she needs to operate. That is also very, very, I think, important in the future. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Rohan. Thank you, ma'am. We've actually... Uh, uh, Rohan, uh, uh, I want to say, is it the cortex preservation and the ovarian preservation, preservation are one and the same thing? Yes, madam. So ovarian tissue cut. Basically, when we do a ovarian tissue cryopreservation, ma'am, what they what we do is mm -hmm. after the ovary, we actually separate the medulla and the cortex. After that, the cortex is further mm -hmm. thinned out and then frozen into strips. In fact, at our center, we've frozen about nine uh, ovaries so far, but we have not yet been had the opportunity to re-implant them. The mm -hmm. women have not yet come back. So I can't. Have you all uh, re-implant autografted it? No, madam. That's what I was That's just what saying. Was saying. Uh, ovaries, but unfortunately, not had the opportunity of re-grafting them. Of okay. course, they weren't our patients. We were called to do the tissue freezing. They okay. were the gynecologist patient. Madam, okay. once again, I want to say thank you. I've, I've madam, given uh, uh, Rohan, before you closed down, before you close down, I want to have one answer from you. See, when do you... Mm -hmm. Plan surgery prior to ART. Now, this is the biggest scare because Ramni <laughs> is asking me the question. I, I did like... not ask this. Yeah, Has... I know. Very complicated. Has... Yeah. <laughs> so, Has... in, fact, yeah. in fact, Vandana ma'am actually gave one very important thing that, see, as infertility specialists, we always do our own scans. So number one is if we see the endometrioma is big and it can impede our way for an ovum pickup. At that point, obviously, we need to consider doing okay. the surgery. But after thoroughly counseling the patient about the fact that, look, Ovarian the only thing we're thinking of surgery prior is because we could have this complication during the pickup. So we'd like to remove the endometriosis, uh, endometrioma and then only go ahead with the surgery. That is one uh, decision which would uh, impact me to uh, uh, consider surgery prior to doing uh, ART. Then pain, another pain, important and pain, and pain, sorry, pain, 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 of course. Pain is the most important yes. thing. Yeah. Dr. Parul, do you, have, do you want to say something? 
<coughs> Dr. Parul, would you want Dr. to say Asha, something? Madam. Yeah, Dr. Rohan, is there yes, any criterion for the size of the endometriotic? Madam, honestly, Asha, ma'am, I earlier we used to have well, yeah, huh? if it's a three centimeter or four centimeter, <coughs> but I think now we have to go as per the quality of Body. life of the patient rather than the size of the endometrioma. Yeah. Even if it's a two or three centimeter uh, cyst with a very bad quality of life with dysmenorrhea, at that point, we may have to even consider okay. surgery prior to uh, going in yeah. for treatment. Yeah, I would like to Dr. say something. Rohan. Yeah, me, I think me and Dr. Rohan, we have learned from the same mentors and I have learned from Dr. Rohan as well, but we, have, we might have different experiences. So as Dr. Rohan said, I think we had a... a uh, cases in which when we pierce the endometrioma and it is lead to abscesses also and removal of ovary also because of the puncture and creation of ovarian abscess. So those situations are tricky where when the endometrioma comes uh, at the site of the ovarian pickup where we have to uh, retrieve the follicles. So uh, in that cases, we have to take a... Uh, decision wherein we have to remove the ovarian endometrioma first or do the egg retrieval first. So those are the tricky situations and no matter in those situations whether we suppress them giving OC pills or luprolide injections and all the endometrioma does not get suppressed and then these are the only cases where surgery comes first. But I would like to share with you one interesting quip. David mm -hmm. Redwing he was a lifetime surgeon for endometriosis, recently passed away, last month only. And he was very influential and he has quoted somewhere that don't give GNRH, operate. Three times he kept on repeating. And another interesting word he has mentioned is that if you push data too much, the data succumbs. So don't only look at data, look at your patient. And whatever is best for your patient, do that. Okay. I think that's enough for today. Thank you, Dr. Parul. Rohan, what were you going to say? Nothing, madam. I was just hoping that uh, Parul Khanna was not driving while talking on the webinar. That was all. Yeah, actually, she was driving only. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Parul, Dr. Varna, ma'am, Dr. Anu, and Dr. Rohan for a beautifully uh, take home message. Now I'm giving. I want to, um, if you. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because, sure, sure. Uh, because Dr. Kodavala now has reminded me of Dr. David Redwine. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. David Redwine was living in Oregon. Uh, I asked him, can I come to your center? He said, I'm living 100 miles away from the nearest big road. Do you really want to come to me? And uh, also, I wanted to invite him in my next crosstalk episode. He passed away before that. Uh, he was propagating genetic mapping technique for the diagnosis and the etiology of uh, endometriosis. And uh, similarly, there are some newer techniques. So I all, all I want to say is the technical part, the take-home message that I want to say is there are many different school of thoughts developing in various corners of the world. And some people actually have not really accepted what they are doing because they lack evidence. For example, Dr. David Redwine had lost his practice license, actually, because of the different things that he yeah. used to say. So Ashley never accepted what he said. So yeah. and then, uh, like for 10 years, he didn't have the license to practice. But he was still propagating. His first wife was an endometriosis patient, and he dived deep into the subject because of that. And um, also, another school of now, Dr. Ramni Devi is a part of the research program, the Salivary MRNA. So my point is just that people have courage, they gather guts and do something new because this is the last bit in gynecology endometriosis, which is so enigmatic. It leaves enough space for to do something new. But at the same time, uh, unless we know about the technique, we should be carefully talking about those things to our patients because yeah. patients are spending money. So there is one evidence-based thing and then there is an experimental or a context-based thing. So I always tell my patients, okay, this much is evidence-based. After this, now I'm going to talk to you about something experimental-based. So you decide if you really want to spend your money and do that. So information is very important for the patients. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I could go on. Uh, more thoughts are coming in my mind, but just this, that the it is the it is for the patient. We are just an instrument 
we are just it's not for us this information or this uh, uh, contacts or the social knowledge is not for us it is that the patient should actually be conveyed that this is actually evidence based and this is experimental based and then they should take a decision what they should do on their body and also where they spend their money you know so uh, that's all <laughs> Well, Anu, I can add here that uh, endometriosis surgery has been the graveyard of endoscopic surgeons. Harry Rich's license was also withdrawn because he persisted doing difficult endometriosis surgery. And I uh, forget the name. Uh, he was from UK and he was uh, secretary of British Endoscopy Society. And his license was withdrawn to the extent that he had to go to Australia because no hospital in UK was ready to take him. So one has to be cautious, of course, when one in, indulges in a surgery of endometriosis. But at the same time, if there is no other option, one has to offer it to the patient. There are two questions also, Uma. See, the first is do dose of GnRH and progesterone together in young and the duration. Uh, so GnRH agonist, honestly, um, I don't prefer to use in younger patients when I'm talking about just about dysmenorrhea. Infertility, when we talk about after doing the oocyte pickup, I prefer giving the depot monthly of 3.75 uh, uh, milligrams. Um, I hope my math is right. Yeah, 3.75 yeah. milligrams. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. If, I'm, if I'm using progesterone, I generally prefer using Dynogest of 2 milligrams once daily. Uh, I have not really used both in combination. In fact, Ideally, don't ever switch from Dynogest to GnRH agonist. It has shown, there have been recent yes. studies which have talked about a lot of mental health depression, especially in women taking this long term. Thanks, Rohan and Anu. Thanks, Rohan and Anu and Dr. Vanna. Well, as a chairperson, now I request my coach, convener, Dr. Ablasha Kumar, for further proceedings. For thank you, Dr. Uma. Thank you, Dr. Uma. Thank and uh, good evening to all uh, respected and esteemed faculty and all the delegates. And now we come to the third session. The topic is recurrent adolescent endometriosis. And we have our two chairpersons, Dr. Kuldeep Jain and Dr. Shubha Pandey, ma'am. Dr. Kuldeep Jain, sir, uh, he is the founder, secretary, and past president of Indian Fertility Society. He is the Chairperson International Exchange Committee, Indian Fertility Society. He is an Editor-in-Chief, Fertility Science and Research. And uh, he brought a Shrek Campus Course, IFFS, World Congress Infusion, Joint Conference of Shrek IFS ISAR to India. He has been the Chairperson Endometriosis Committee of FOXI from 2016 to 2019. He is the chairperson of Fusion 2024. He was on the board of directors from 2016 to 2019. And he has delivered several lectures and orations. He was the recipient of Lifetime Achievement Award, IFS, Appreciation Awards from IFS, IMA, DMA, and FOXY. He was recipient of Rajdhani Gaurav Samman. We welcome you, sir. And our other chairperson is Dr. Shubha Pandey, ma'am. Uh, she's a senior obstetrician gynecologist, and um, she's at present the president of Ops Gynae Society of Prayagraj. She has professional experience of more than 40 years. She has been the teacher and guide of many DNB and DGO students, and her special contributions are in the field of safe motherhood, high-risk pregnancy, infertility, cancer screening programs geriatric pro problems. We welcome you, ma'am. Uh, I would request Dr. Shubha, ma'am, to please introduce our stalwart speaker, Dr. Anjana Khanna, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am uh, actually needs no introduction. She is a brilliant orator, and ma'am, we all know you. And uh, for the um, formal introduction, member from 2021 to 25 and very recently ma'am has organized a very very successful conference scientific sangam at prayagraj and uh, she's the founder president of isopop society, uh, prayagraj society and uh, she's a recipient of many 
Foxy Achiever Award 2022, Foxy Dhira Award, and DK Tank Reproductive Healthcare Promotion AICOG 2015. Uh, and she has been faculty in many national and international conferences. And most important, ma'am, is the presidential candidate. <laughs> we welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Abhilasha. Good evening, everyone. I'll be speaking on recurrent endometriosis in adolescents. What next? It is a formidable challenge. Remains a riddle wrapped in mystery inside an enigma. Adolescent endometriosis is unique in a sense that the girl has to spend the major part of her life with immense suffering and decreased fertility prospects. It is The incidence is very difficult to quantify, but 47% of the girls, adolescent girls, have to undergo laparoscopy for chronic pelvic pain. Such is the amount of suffering. Earlier reports was that adolescent endometriosis was exclusively restricted to stage 1 and 2, but now it is seen that there is a significant proportion of advanced stage disease, third, third stage and fourth stage, and all stages of endometriosis including deep endometriosis, ovarian endometriomas are found in adolescent girls. So the condition is not now limited to early forms only. So why is this? Probably because of misdiagnosis and uh, this has been talked about earlier and uh, there could be delay in diagnosis because the symptoms are atypical or atypical endometriotic lesions. And the time gap, as Dr. Ramni had said, that the time gap between the actual disease starting and the detection of the disease is one and a half to seven years. So the atypical symptoms could be dysmenorrhea, which is resistant to non-steroidal uh, steroidal, anti-inflammatory drugs and or OCPs, acyclical chronic pelvic pain, dyschezia, constipation, intestinal cramps, exercise pain and bladder pain. And of course, in the sexually active teenagers, he could report dyspareunia and absentism from school. So these are some of the some pictures showing the atypical endometriotic lesions, which could be missed. So these are subtle atypical lesions. They can easily be missed during laparoscopy. These white lesions, as we see, they are atypical clear endometriosis lesions which are studying the peritoneum of the posterior cul-de-sac. So even if you are doing a laparoscopy, you can miss these lesions somehow. And uh, these, this is hemorrhagic endometriosis. And uh, this is cortical endometriosis involving the left ovary. And this is scattered variable. I mean, this is quite typical of endometriosis. So <clears throat> management has the major issues. Because the girl is so young and she's already got endometriosis. So early diagnosis and prompt treatment may reduce the risk of future sequelae, including multiple laparoscopies in adulthood. Preserving fertility is the main aim, along with improving the quality of life, as told by Rohan. So there's a lot of social and psychological impact. Endometriosis constitutes a disabling condition which particularly affects the social relationships as well as sexual and mental health. Several studies have highlighted the impact of chronic pelvic pain on the psychological well-being of women and adolescents with endometriosis as well as on the quality of life. Notably, pelvic pain and infertility are commonly associated with psychic vulnerability and these kids can also go on to drug abuse. So the debate comes, when we talk about medical management, the debate is, one school of thought says that early medical treatment improves the long-term outcome. The other school of thought says, simply increases the number of interventions without actually preventing the disease progression. So what are the medical therapies which we have to offer? This has been talked in great detail, but just to name NSAIDs, COCPs, uh, load with low-dose estrogen, progestogens, dinogest, LNG, IUS, GNRH, agonist, along with at-back therapy. So dinogest, which is the latest kid on the block, 
profound effect on endometriotic lesion with anti-androgenic and little estrogenic glucocorticoid mineralocorticoid activity. The safety is well proven in adults, but in adolescents, the second phase of uh, studies is still being done and Dinogest 2 milligrams OD for 52 weeks causes a decrease of the BMD of the lumbar spine. So, and there's only partial recovery after stopping of the treatment. LNG IUS, it is an acceptable option in older adolescents who are sexually active and especially those in whom leparoscopy was done for chronic pelvic pain, endometriosis found, and then we insert the LNG IUS so that to, uh, there is no recurrence later on. It is very effective in reducing recurrence and it does not have an effect on BMD, no change in lipid profile, but insertion may be difficult. So now you have those ultra thin <coughs> LNG IUS Skyla 12 milligrams. GNRH agonist is well proven and uh, an RCT was done, 51 adolescents treated with GNRH therapy along with ADBAC. So it was norethistone acetate, 5 milligrams per day, along with conjugated equine estradio, 0.6 to 5 milligrams per day. It maintained the bone health and the quality of life. So practical considerations on long-term medical therapy. Surgical confirmation of diagnosis is preferred, but not nowadays. Nowadays, we prefer to diagnose with the help of uh, ultrasound, MRI, and uh, so many guidelines support the treatment initiation with NSAIDs and hormone treatment without laparoscopic diagnosis. After proper counseling, detailed history taking is very important. To protect the ovarian reserve, there's increasing trend towards medical management in asymptomatic patients. Laparoscopy for diagnosis alone is not indicated. Combined <laughs> approach of surgery followed by post-operative medical therapy offers the best long-term outcome. The, our treatment should be patient-centric and goal-oriented approach should be there. So now we talk about the surgical management. Laparoscopy, we know, is the gold standard for diagnosing and treating. Implants can be destroyed by a electrocautery, coagulation, ablation, or excision. The lysis of addition should also be performed. LNG IUS can be inserted at the time of laparoscopy. The appropriate timing of surgery for adolescent endometriosis is again debatable. Some recommend avoiding surgery as long as possible due to high recurrence rates following surgery. But others opine that surgical intervention at an early stage to prevent development of more severe lesions and eliminate endometriosis completely should be done. But further research is needed to determine the best approach at the proper time for adolescent endometriosis. So we are in a dilemma. Now, when we talk about endometrioma surgery, some say if it is, uh, it should be very radical and many interventions may be needed. But what is the outcome? Impaired ovarian reserve. Now, if it is less radical, there'll be recurrence. Leproscopic uh, cystectomy for endometriomas more than 4 centimeters that are causing pain is level A RCOG recommendation. Avoid surgery if it is a painless endometrioma less than 4 centimeters, minimal to mild stage endometriosis. Assessment of AMH prior to surgery is mandatory. And please avoid unnecessary surgery. Each case has to be individualized. Careful surgery by experienced hands, as Rohan has said, that please call an experienced surgeon who is focused on endometriosis surgery to do the surgery. It, and, uh, it should prevent injury to the follicular reserve and prevent post-surgical additions. Choosing the best surgical technique to avoid surgical da uh, ovarian damage Excessive stripping of the ovarian cortex and use of bipolar coagulation to stop bleeding is to be avoided. Bilateral cystectomy of endometrioma in particular reduces the serum AMH dramatically. So what is the limitation? It is suppressive rather than curative. 
contraceptive rather than fertility promoting. Endometrioma is lacked for effective medical therapy. We have to do surgery. Limited option for deep infiltrating endometriosis. And little research has been done for central sensitization. Risk factors of recurrence. Bilateral pelvic involvement. Previous surgery. Tenderness, nodularity at the cul-de-sac. Post-operative, it has been found that the AFS is high. Younger age, type of surgery, pre- and post-operative medical therapy. So, spontaneous res uh, recurrent endometriosis, when we talk about that, we see that spontaneous resolution sometimes in the lucky ones occurs in about 20% of endometriosis, stage 1 to 2. Residual disease could be there, persistence of symptoms or reappearance of symptoms within three months. So even if the disease is residual, we can, if we review it after three months, we may think it has recurred. Recurrence usually appears after three months. Incidence 6 to 30 percent in various studies depends on the age, stage of disease, prior treatment, completeness of surgery, extent of peritoneal disease usually presents as chronic pelvic pain and dysmenorrhea. Now, how do we diagnose rising CA125 by transvaginal sonography, MRI, leproscopy, treatment is painkillers, hormones, progestogens, OCPs, GNRA channel logs. Conservative surgery is indicated if medical therapy fails or contraindicated or there are intolerable side effects. Cystectomy, adesiolysis may be an option after IVF fails. Post-operative hormone therapy delays recurrence but does not reduce the recurrence. LNG IUCD, it is very effective in recurrent disease and the pan-ultimate treatment is hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. So what is important is catch them young and limit the recurrence. If we can predict that this girl will lead to extensive disease or settle to mild disease, we can make our approach tailor-made and perform either, there are again many schools of thought, they say performing more extensive surgery would be better and some say do not do unnecessary intervention. So are the adolescent endometriosis, is it different from adult endometriosis? Uh, it has been said that there is a different origin because uh, in, in the new nates, sometimes there is uterine bleeding and these are the patients who uh, actually end up in adolescent endometriosis. Otherwise, the uh, theories are the same because of regurgitation of the menstrual blood and we all know about it. So, uh, there are some biomarkers which can predict recurrence, but they are all in the phase one study. We have genetic biomarkers, blood-based biomarkers, immune markers, glycoprotein, cell addition, invasive markers, but, you know, out of all these, the COX-2 expression, NFKB and ER gene polymorphism have shown to be good markers for predicting recurrence. So most of the endometriosis biomarker studies have remained at level of phase one and very few have made it to phase two. So what are the risk factors, maternal and reproductive factors? I think we all know that early age of menarche, short menstrual cycles, prolonged cycles, then the obstructive lesions in the Mullerian ducts, and uh, then positive family history is, of course, very important. And in that case, you can expect recurrence. Then obesity is linked to endometriosis. The more obese the female, the more the chances of endometriosis are there. Then some also say that there are some environmental toxins like cigarette smoking, women with low birth weight, alcohol, caffeine, then physical characteristics could also play a role. And uh, then lifestyle factors, indoor exposure to passive smoking and uh, night shift work. They say that is very uh, important cause of endometriosis because it disrupts the circadian uh, estrogen secretions. So that could lead to endometriosis, but these are all conjectures. And we have a lot of dietary factors which are being considered. Then, uh, so then now we talk about what Rohan had talked about. So we should explain everything to the girl and the parents, egg donation, 
and or cryopreservation if there is low ovarian reserve, excision of the ovarian tissue and autografting. Vitrification, more successful in terms of oocyte survival. Then we have, in but in prepubescent girls, immature oocyte cryopreservation is the only method to preserve fertility, but using prophase 1 geminal vesicle increases the risk of zona pellucida hardening and hence chromosomal aneuploidy. Well, I'll read uh, for you. The newer treatment that are being available are angiogenesis inhibitors, the antioxidants like vitamin C and E, the tumor necrosis factor TNF alpha 1, matrix melatoproteinase inhibitors, immunomodulators, Chinese methods and gins uh, like um, uh, they should be Chinese methods, green tea. Stem cell therapy and gene therapy are basically the new treatments being provided for the treatment of endometriosis. Now, carry on. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Pentoxifilin could change the immune cell function by inhibition of cytokine and TNF alpha secretion. VEGFC suggested to be an effective factor for significant reduction in the endometriotic implants. There's another immunomodulator. Etanercept ETA has promising reductive effect. But you know what next? Clinicians can use oxidized regenerated cellulose during operative laparoscopy for endometriosis because it prevents addition formation. During laparoscopy in young women, please insert Mirena to prevent recurrence. Although many women with endometriosis do conceive naturally and easily, women with endometriosis are more likely to have difficulty in conceiving. This is mainly due to the effect of inflammation in the pelvis, which can cause metabolic stress for the ova in this environment. Surgery for endometriomas can also reduce the ovarian reserve. Egg freezing technology has improved. It is possible for young women with endometriosis to freeze the ova so that they can use them to conceive later in life. And what is our duty as gynecologists to provide more information about preserving fertility. Thank you all so much. And on this platform, I would request all of you to please give me your vote and support for Foxy President election year 2024. That is this year. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for such a brilliant talk. And now I would request Dr. Kuldeep Jain to please uh, give his expert comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ranjana, it was really a, a wonderful overview of uh, adolescent endometriosis. Uh, as we know that adolescent endometriosis is a little difficult to diagnose. And uh, as such, the endometriosis is uh, diagnosed uh, by almost seven years of delay. And because of this, most of these patients who are having adolescent endometriosis, they are not diagnosed. They are not reaching to the right person uh, uh, for treatment. And that is one important thing in cases of uh, adolescent endometriosis. That is why it is very important for all gynecologists and uh, even all health providers that they should be thinking of endometriosis in adolescent women. Until unless they don't, they think of endometriosis, uh, they cannot diagnose adolescent endometriosis. And that is a real challenge at present. Uh, so what I will like to uh, comment on adolescent endometriosis, if really we need to make a comment, that uh, awareness of adolescent endometriosis, that should be percolated throughout FOXI members, because these are the people who are going to take care of adolescent people. Because most of the time, when the girl is a young girl is having pain, they are just, uh, either they don't tell to anyone, they keep on suffering. If they tell their parents, most of the time they are just told that, no, the pain is normal for the menstruation. So, uh, they are not given due care. Uh, they cannot talk about the menstruation in most of the cases and they keep on suffering. So I think uh, we should, as a Foxy, and we should have 
some sort of uh, school health awareness. Yeah, awareness to program. Get, to get more. When I was the endometriosis committee chairperson, we did a, a uh, pan-Indian survey and we found that what, what prevalence we are having in India is very, very different. And uh, we are just seeing the tip of iceberg as far as the prevalence of adolescent endometriosis is concerned. So I think that is one point which I like to make. Uh, thinking of ad, uh, endometriosis in adolescent girls. Yeah, Second especially point, if the girl comes with uh, dysmenorrhea, then we yeah. should think of uh, endometriosis. Even a school absenting, <clears throat> like when, yeah. when the girl is missing her school for more than... Uh, eight occasions in one year, there should be suspected endometriosis. This is one of the criteria of actually adolescent endometriosis because the girls, they will, they will not miss the school unnecessarily. So if they are missing because of pain, they should be investigated. So that is one of the criteria of our adolescent endometriosis. Is the management part like once they are diagnosed, you have to think a hundred times before putting a knife in an adolescent girl. So, the primary, primary management of adolescent endometriosis remains medical, whatever size of endometrioma. <laughs> so, that is very, very clear. Nobody should uh, just offer because the girl is having uh, uh, a endometrioma, uh, should not be offered surgery at first place. That is very, very important. There are very few indications of uh, uh, surgery in adolescent endometriosis. Uh, rest of them, they can always benefit from the long-term uh, 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 hormonal management. So that is... Again, a very important point to make as far as the adolescent endometriosis is concerned. Uh, third thing, when they are offered and uh, uh, what you call uh, surgical management, then it should be done at the right place. Anybody should not no, operate adolescent up. endometriosis because the first surgery oh, is very, very, very important. It should be a complete surgery to avoid recurrent endometriosis. Otherwise, the girl is going to suffer throughout their reproductive life. They will be having a uh, lot of problems as far as the uh, uh, AMH is concerned. So when you are doing surgery in adolescent patient, it should be offered at right place. A right person should be doing the uh, uh, endometriosis surgery in adolescent patients and a complete surgery to avoid uh, what you call uh, uh, recurrence. So these are few important things as far as the adolescent endometriosis is concerned. Nowadays, when I go for the school counseling, when the patient complains of dysmenorrhea, just like that, we cannot tell. You take some tablets and you divert your mind. You take liquid diet, it will be all right. But you should have it. Many. Everything is not an endometriosis, but still it has to be ruled out in the adolescent itself. Yes. Whether, uh, whether it is because such that we can reduce the incidence of infertility and other complications. So patients, I give the question answers before the counseling, how it was and after the counseling, how it was. Mm. Full counseling. But most of the time, now the adolescents are very well aware of endometriosis. PCOS, we know by a mother. No, PCOS, they are more aware of PCOS. Aware. So that is rather extreme. But Anybody who aware. is, any girl who is obese immediately says that I must be having PCOS. Oh, yes, that's all. No exercise, nothing but PCOS. But <laughs> endometriosis, they are very, very aware. We should also create some awareness. Every, whenever we go to school, I yeah. have all topics, nutrition, endometriosis, PCOS, sexual health, mental health, everything we should cover. Yes. Definitely wonderful uh, webinar. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sampath. Lalita, you wanted to say something? Actually, the thing is, the girls, they come with <laughs> typical symptoms of dysmenorrhea with endometriosis. Yes. Yes. But the ultrasound reveals nothing. So what yeah, all the time. How do you Most of the time. Yeah. And TVS can't be done. Yes. And, and EBS I, can't be done in the unmarried yes, girls. This is the problem. Uh, so no, it's also not repeat the ultrasound after, after some time and after it how is, much time if it is required. 
Yes, like, the so many times they will only complain of diffuse abdominal pain, mm. which is a uh, cyclical. So mm. it's not only dysmenorrhea. It's, it's not specific. Specific about endometrial. I mean, like pain before the cycle and on the first day of the cycle with vomiting and all the symptoms. Yeah, and the the have a clue that they are going to go for a bleeding. So yep. this triple is always helpful for them. But uh, we should. Can I make a comment? Things. Can I make a comment? Yeah, here? yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as far as the diagnosis is concerned, uh, this is a very good point because ultrasound uh, is not very sensitive in adolescent endometriosis until unless you are having an endometrioma. If you are not having an endometrioma, it is very difficult to diagnose adolescent endometriosis. And that is the problem why, why the mm. these girls they keep on suffering. So, yeah. I again come back to my point. Suspicion of endometriosis is very important to yes. detect these uh, uh, girls to closely follow. Like there, there may be some uh, uh, deep infiltrative endometriosis, which cannot be because you cannot do a transvaginal sonography there. Transabdominal sonography is having very poor sensitivity as far as the DIE is concerned. So you are having two options there. Either you go for a transrectal ultrasound that is highly sensitive for uh, DIE and that is yeah. again a very less used modality uh, because of some reason or other. Not many gynecologists, many radiologists, they are doing transrectal ultrasound, but that is one thing which I think uh, we have to keep in mind. Second, MRI is good. MRI, MRI, is good. MRI you can detect uh, uh, a deep nodule in uh, by MRI, Very but if it is a very be given empirical treatment on the basis of symptoms, mm. given for we can. Yes, you can. We can. We can. So how long can it be given? Uh, Doctor Ramni was saying na, that this combination na, of uh, dinogest yeah. and ethnyl estradiol low dose, we can yeah. give that. That will relieve the cyclical. I mean, in a cyclical manner. How so long? that will relieve the pain. That's How long in a, in a young girl? Three months. Girl three months. Uh, Dr. Ramni, I think uh, three to six months. Three, three months. And if the symptoms are relieved, Even it for means a that year, the patient is, the girl is having and Some are taking for a year also. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can yeah. give... Uh, uh, Manju, madam, I think we can continue to have this OC pill. Hey, what I say, it, if it relieves the symptoms in three months, yes. it diagnoses yes. Yes. It diagnoses endometriosis. That's what I say. Okay, then yes. I will come back. I will come out with one diagnostic test because now we have non-invasive diagnostic testing for endometriosis. It has come up in a big way. That is, I have worked on this microRNAs in the peripheral circulating blood and we have found out that we have published a paper on more than 56 young girls, all less than 21 years, starting from 14 to 21 years. We have done the peripheral sampling and we have shortlisted three miRNAs. And if they are found to have positive for that circulating microRNA, then they are 100% we can say that they are suffering from endometriosis and it is worthwhile starting them on progestin. So the same same work has been reflected by Dr. Phillips Destam, who is who was the vice chair of FIGO. He has done it in the salivary MIRNA. Okay, okay. so the cost test they cost have factor got cost factor cost factor MIRNA. Now we are able to do this three MIRNAs for three thousand rupees. Oh, oh, that's what I wanted. Yeah, that's what I very wanted. Very nice. Can wait. Yeah, three thousand rupees. Probably soon uh, we can expect a. Uh, uh, card test for in our country also. So CMP. it is much cheaper than uh, doing an MRI. Yes. MRI. Yes. 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 MRI still see we cannot pick up the uh, 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 I mean the deposits when they are less than one centimeter. Is it available? Okay. Probably. Is it available? The Pardon? Is it available in India? You want to know whether it is available in India? Yes. We is are it? doing it. We Please are getting it done from yeah, yeah, yeah. I will send you. Give us the details. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a question uh, in the question and answer section. Uh, while operating for endometriosis in women in 30s who have completed their family, 
can we leave behind an ovary which looks grossly normal and unaffected by endometriosis while taking out the uterus and the other ovary along with peritoneal endometriosis? So, I, I so, really I don't think we should leave behind the other ovary because that is a, already there is peritoneal endometriosis and one ovary is affected. So uh, there are chances that microscopic implants could be there on the, it is just appearing grossly normal. What do you say, Ramni? Yeah, it is the indication for doing a bilateral. Yes, we have to remove both the ovaries. Even at because 30. the recurrence rate are going to be, leave behind the ovaries is going to be, even after hysterectomy, it will be more than 18%. Yeah, yeah. it is going to be deadly. So always recurrence. Is <coughs> yeah, yeah. And especially the since the peritoneum and the most is also thing involved. Is, even, even if you do a hysterectomy with BSO, with all the peritoneal uh, thing uh, uh, done, you have to then follow up the patient with post-operative suppressive therapy. Follow up the patient, post-operative suppressive therapy is a must. Therapy is a must. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Parma, so ma'am, would you want to say something before we conclude, uh, conclude? So first, I would like to congratulate all the three speakers for such a clear cut, rather a crystal clear cut. <laughs> Only the treatment of it. Of endometriosis, you know, which is, which is a haze, you know, in all aspects of the, uh, all aspects. So I must congratulate all of you. And... Uh, but the only thing I would like to add over here is that whenever a young girl is coming, always try to rule out first the obstructive, uh, obstructive uh, mullerian uh, problems. That's that's because even as a stenosis of the cervical canal can lead on to. So one should be that rule out the, the obstructive part first and then we can do uh, all, all uh, everything else has already been said. Now, one thing is that never do a laparoscopy for diagnostic only. It should yeah. be See and treat. <clears throat> it's not only the diagnosis, see and treat. That should be the basic principle whenever you are subjecting a patient for uh, a person for uh, um, endometriosis. And uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, the, the pre prevention of the recurrence is concerned, that uh, one should always put, you know, as you have already said, LNG IUS system to be, to be done. Uh, is a must. Patient can be given uh, NSAID, progestins, and GNRH for at least six months. For at least six months for the things to occur. And this is going to release the EPP. And uh, um, uh, no, no comment has been done on Danazol. Nothing has been said on Danazol. Nowadays, it's not being used. It's, yes, that's what I wanted to convey, that it is not being used nowadays because of, and because the, because of the androgenic, androgenic side effects. activity. Mm -hmm. And as far as the uh, dinogest is concerned, it is anti-inflammatory, it is anti-angiogenic, and, uh, you know, it is, you know, the, the yes, that, that's why it is being preferred, you know anti-inflammatory, anti-intogenic and anti-proliferative also. So the dinogest is one thing which is, is nowadays coming up a very good alternative to all other therapies provided, you know, there's no, you know, the patient needs something else or the treatment uh, for infertility like GNRH analogs and all that. They, everything has got a, a, you know, typical indication for do, uh, using it. The treatment has to be individualized and the other thing is that dinogest is one drug which can be used as such without thinking of other. Thanks a so lot. One take home message from all the experts, Dr. Kuldeep Jain. Uh, as far as the take home message is concerned, uh, <laughs> because we know that endometriosis is going uh, for lifelong, starting from adolescent to the uh, menopausal age. Uh, we have to take it very seriously at all stages. Whatever patient is uh, presenting with needs to be tackled very carefully. There are enough guidelines available. So please follow the guidelines when the patient is coming to you, whether it is coming at adolescent stage uh, or reproductive stage or post-reproductive. Uh, uh, there are enough guidelines available. Follow the guidelines and keep yourself abreast because this is a changing scenario, fast changing scenario. Uh, 
second uh, important thing is when you are doing surgery in uh, uh, reproductive age group, when the patient is requiring uh, uh, motherhood, uh, you have to be very careful. Mm. Assess whether the surgery is required or there is any other alternative. And that is very, very important as far as the infertility part is concerned. So that is uh, one important take home. Thank, thank you for the wonderful Thank you, Dr. Anjana, for uh, having me here. And uh, Thank you, Dr. Kuldeep. It was such a I pleasure. Wish all the best. I wish you all the best for your... <laughs> thank you so much. I need it. Thank you so much, all the experts. And uh, now I would like to thank today's chief guest, Dr. Parul Kordawala, sir, for sparing his valuable time and bestowing his blessings on us. I would like to thank the guest of honor, Dr. Sampat Kumari, ma'am. I would like to thank our uh, own Dr. Manju Varma, ma'am, scientific expert, who is always an inspiration for us. I would like to thank Dr. Anjana, ma'am, the organizing chairperson, person for this wonderful webinar. I would like to thank uh, the chairpersons, Dr. Asha Rao, ma'am, Dr. Lalita Shukla, ma'am, Dr. Anu Chavla, ma'am, Dr. Vanna Bansal, ma'am, Dr. Kuldeep Jain, sir, and Dr. Shubha Pandey, ma'am. And I would like to thank the brilliant speakers who benefited all of us with their wonderful presentations, Dr. T. Ramni, ma'am, Dr. Rohan Palse Shetkar, Dr. Anjana Khanna, ma'am, and uh, Last but not the least, I would like to thank the uh, the whole team of Jackson Pal Pharmaceuticals, especially Dr. Deepika and Dr. Amit, for their cooperation and help in organizing this wonderful Scientific Sangam 29 webinar. I would also thank like you. to thank ICOG for granting us two ICOG points. Thank, thank you. you very much to all the experts, the faculty present with us today and the attendees. So for HMB and dysmenorrhea, the oral contraceptive, which is DREG, which is Dinogest 2 mg plus ethanyl estradiol 30 mcg tablet. For Dinogest 2 mg, please prescribe endoreg, endometriosis regression at its best. We have Ulipristal acetate 5 mg tablet as Ulipristal for long-term management of uterine fibroids. And Jackson Pal being the truly progestin people, we have the whole range of progesterones available, Divagest range. We have uh, natural micronized progesterone as Divagest, SR tablets, soft gelatin capsule for vaginal use and injection progesterone as Divagest injection. We have Hydrogestron 10 mg tablets as Divatron. Injection maintain 500 and 250, that is 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone caproid. We have norethistron acetate, cyclorex CR10 in controlled release form and also plain cyclorex 5mg tablets and of course Dinogest as endorex. So we look forward to seeing you again 